several interesting topics. I know that we have several members who are coming late, and I apologize uh, to folks in the in the audience as well. I thought we were starting at 10, and uh, so uh, my apologies. Um, so uh, the, my co-chair, uh, Delegate Barve, and I are uh, swap back and forth on meetings, so I will uh, take the lead, I guess, on this one, and, and we will split duties. Um, but uh, I guess let's let's go ahead and jump right into it. Um, so the the major subject today will be the, um, the Maryland's Public Information Act, the fees and the appeals process. And just to give context for folks who um, have any questions about this issue, uh, that we have the concern has arisen to this committee as to the process by which fees are determined across various jurisdictions and municipalities. Um, under the Public Information Act. And so our goal here today is to sort of gather information about um, how different or, uh, uh, levels of government and, and, and organizations of government come up with these fees and see if there is any sort of standardizing process that may be possible that's not too burdensome on local jurisdictions uh, or the state, but that is reasonable. So this is really a fact-gathering um, exercise today, uh, and we look forward to the testimony from the various folks who will be joining us. Um, so we will begin with Adam Snyder, who is Chief Counsel of, of, of the Opinions and Advice for the Office of the Attorney General. Thank you. There it's on. Okay, the red stripe. Transparency is um, is our uh, joint committee meeting being uh, broadcast or transcribed or recorded today? That is an excellent question. Uh, yes, the the for those who may be in the audience virtually, uh, we are being live streamed um, so that everybody is aware. Recorded and live streamed on the House Ways and Means Committee stream on the website. Um, so we should be. It is blinking on air, so we are, in fact, live and on air. Thank you. All right. Good morning, Chairman Barve, Chairman Ferguson, delegates. Um, as uh, the chairman, I, pardon? And Senator. Oh, and Senator. <laughs> um, uh, as, the as the chairman um, described, I'm the, chair, or the uh, chief counsel, opinions and vice division of the attorney general's office, and in that capacity, I oversee uh, the, um, the state's implementation of the Public Information Act. This morning I'm going to uh, spend about uh, 10 to 15 minutes describing the, uh, giving you an overview of the fee and appeal provisions of the Act. And if we have time, I'm uh, available to answer any questions you may have about things that I'm hearing from my uh, position as to how the PIA is being implemented. First, about fees. Uh, the Public Information Act allows the custodian of records for state agencies and local governments to charge, quote, a reasonable fee for the search for, preparation of, and reproduction of a public record, with the caveat that the first two hours involved in that, that process are free of charge. Now, that raises a few questions uh, about what those terms mean. First, reasonable fee. The term reasonable fee is defined by statute to mean a fee bearing a reasonable relationship to the recovery of actual costs incurred by a governmental unit. Now, what that means depends on the activity that's involved in responding to a PIA request. And as I said earlier, the statute identifies three such categories of activities, the search for records, the preparation of records, and the reproduction of records. Now, the search involves um, finding the records within the agency's files in the first place. And that can be as easy as doing a computer search uh, of, uh, for emails or uh, a network search for particular documents. Um, it can also be as involved as doing a file-by-file -file search for uh, uh, particular responsive documents. So the, 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 the difficulties involved in, in searching for records can vary dramatically from request to request. The second category of expenses involved is the preparation of a record. And typically what this involves 
is reviewing the doc document to determine which aspects of it can be provided under the Act. The Act, of course, has several specific exemptions from disclosure, and it's up to the agency to review those documents to determine whether uh, the agency may permissibly disclose the records under the Act. That can also involve redacting. If a particular document is generally disclosable, but there are particular types of information in it that is exempt from disclosure, the agency has to take the time to identify those passages and redact them. The last category of expenses is the one that's perhaps more familiar to everyone, and that's the, the copying cost, the cost of reproducing the record. Um, typically, that's just a per page uh, a copy charge, but uh, under certain circumstances, the, the statute also allows for um, a, f a reasonable fee for, make, for the making of or supervising the making of a copy of a record. So if you have uh, a particularly voluminous request, the statute provides some um, uh, ability for an agency to uh, charge, for example, the labor that is involved to actually stand at the, uh, at the copier if it's going to take several hours to do that. And some agencies in their uh, fee schedules actually provide for that e expressly. Now, I want to uh, talk about how this, these provisions get enacted or, or get um, uh, implemented in practice. The cost for the first two categories of activities, the search and preparation, um, varies fairly widely across uh, state agencies. Some agencies have in their regulations a flat per hour fee for performing that type of review, and that fee also varies amongst those agencies. For example, uh, DHMH regulations have a, t a $25 per hour fee. Uh, MHEC has a $20 per hour fee. Uh, the Motor Vehicle Administration has a $30 hour fee and a $250 hour, uh, dollar an hour fee for um, computer programmers to write specific programs to generate reports in response to requests. Other agencies have, um, have uh, fees broken out by how, uh, how high up within the, the institution the person uh, um, uh, who is processing the request sits, so supervisory personnel get uh, charged out at a higher rate than, than clerical personnel. The Department of the Environment regulations have um, a, a kind of uh, a variegated uh, fee structure along those lines. Other agencies still will take, will look at the actual gross salary of the person who's involved in responding to the request calculate that down to a per hour expense and then charge at that rate so it will differ from employee to employee within that agency. So there's, there's like I said, a fair bit of, uh, of range in how agencies approach that. There's also a fair bit of range in the per page copying charge that agencies uh, charge under the PI, although it's perhaps not as broad. Probably about half of the agencies charge uh, 25 cents per page, but it ranges from, uh, from a low of, uh, I think MVA charges only 3.5 cents per page for certain types of, of documents to a high of 51 uh, cents per page that the Board of Public Works charges. Um, and, but there are, there's agencies at pretty much every price point between those two. So it is spread out fairly broadly, although, like I said, uh, probably the predominant fee is 25 cents per page. If, however, well, sometimes an agency will get a request for documents that they can't copy in-house. One example would be large oversized property plats. Uh, in that instance, agencies have statutory authority to charge what the actual cost is for providing the facilities to copy that document. So if they send it out to a Kinko's that charges five bucks a page, that's what the agency would charge. The, there are provisions in the Act also to allow for the waiver of fees. 
And fee waivers are available if the applicant requests a fee waiver and the agency or the custodian <coughs> after considering the ability of the applicant to pay the fee and other relevant factors, determines that waiver of a fee would be in the public interest. Now, the statute specifically says that the agency has to consider the applicant's ability to pay, but it also says that the agency consider other relevant factors. So the fact that an applicant can or cannot pay is not necessarily dispositive. The test here is whether it, a fee waiver is in the public interest. And the types of factors that the uh, courts tend to evaluate here is, is the request, does the request have significance really only for the requester or a very narrow um, group of people, or does it have a wider significance? The wider the significance, the more likely that the fee waiver would be uh, in a public interest. Also, does the requester have the means to disseminate uh, his or her message to the public? So, uh, for example, uh, a prison inmate may be less likely to get a fee waiver despite their, you know, fairly obvious inability to pay because they tend to be seeking documents for their own post-conviction proceedings and really don't have the means to broadcast a larger message that would kind of implicate the public interest provisions of the Public Information Act. Conversely, a newspaper, which um, uh, uh, very much has the ability to disseminate a message, uh, is, is typically the, 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 the type of requester who is in a good position to get, uh, obtain a fee waiver. Now, uh, before I move on to appeals, uh, I, I do want to talk a little bit about um, how I see the, uh, fees working in practice and um, kind of what I see as the, the policy justifications that you will, will consider in, in, in your deliberations on what to do about fees. Um, the importance, there, there's two parts of, of the fee provisions of the Act that, that are important to, to consider here. One is that it encourages requesters to think about what materials they're interested in and to request just those materials rather than the kind of uh, catch-all requests that you tend to see in, for example, in litigation. You know, give me all documents relating to the pollution of the Chesapeake Bay is going to re reveal an astonishing or encompass an astonishing number of documents and generate a very high fee request. The fact that that request will generate a fee that the applicant will be responsible for encourages them to sit down with the agency. Again, perhaps the, the requester doesn't really know how to describe what it is they're after. Um, but it, the, the fee provision encourages that requester to begin that dialogue with the agency and, and find a way of crafting a request that gets at the stuff that they're really interested in with the least inconvenience to the agency and the least expense to the applicant. The, the other policy aspect of this is who should be bearing the cost of submitting PIA requests. Um, whenever someone submits a request and the agency has to divert resources to fulfilling that request, that means that the agency's other customers or regulated community um, at least theoretically, should experience a drop in the services that they receive because folks will be um, uh, fulfilling PIA requests. Now, that, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the Public Information Act is a law just as the other laws that agencies uh, uh, enact. But the, the, the PIA fee provisions and the waiver provisions are kind of based on the, the policy, policy choice that if a request is truly in the public interest, well, then you waive the fee and the whole public pays for it. If, however, the, the request is more of a private matter or more narrow with a more limited significance, well, in that instance, the public shouldn't be footing the cost of responding to that request. The requester should. So those are uh, some of the policy considerations that are at, at play in how the, the, the fee uh, provisions work. 
I want to move on to appeals because um, I'm, I'm tasked with covering that as well, but I'm, I'm happy to answer questions at the end about uh, fees as well. The appeal provisions are, are basically twofold. For state agencies that are subject to the state uh, APA, requesters have, uh, can request an administrative appeal uh, to the agency, which tends to get routed to the, the Office of Administrative Hearings, but doesn't necessarily have to be, um, to determine whether the request is in a, or, or the, the, the denial of the request is in accordance with the law. That provision doesn't apply, though, to local governments um, who are not subject to the, uh, to the APA. The judicial review provisions, however, are, sub, are, are applicable to all governmental entities that are subject to the Public Information Act. And uh, requesters who have been denied inspection of a record have the opportunity to petition for judicial review in the circuit court um, in the jurisdiction where they're located. And they have no need to take advantage of the administrative appeal provisions before they do so. There's no exhaustion requirement. So if you're requesting records from the Department of the Environment, a state agency, you don't have to do the administrative agency approach first. You can go straight to court. Local government request, you go to straight to court anyway. Appeals are to be expedited in every way. The agency has the burden to support its denial. The court, if it determines that uh, materials were improperly withheld, may order that documents be turned over, may impose counsel fees and other litigation costs. The court may also, in um, certain circumstances, award damages for instances where the agency, uh, by uh, clear and convincing evidence, knowingly and willfully um, uh, refuses to turn over documents that it uh, is uh, obligated to uh, turn over. I'm not aware of, I am not familiar myself with any instance in which those provisions have been invoked or applied by a court. That's not to say that it hasn't happened. It could, uh, it could have happened. It's just not something that rose to the level of, a, of an appellate decision. Uh, Mr. John Garius, who will be uh, speaking um, later, um, stumbled uh, to his disadvantage on a, a little ambiguity in the statute, uh, that ambiguity being it, it provides for judicial review uh, for the denial of the inspection of a record and doesn't say anything about the denial of um, copies. And Mr. John Garius, well, before, uh, Mr. John Garius will, I'm sure, talk to you about his personal experience with that provision. Um, we had noticed that ambiguity in the statute and had provided in our, uh, in the Attorney General's Office, uh, Maryland Public Information Act manual, um, the prediction that uh, a reviewing court would likely construe the provision as applying to the provision of copies as well, since the statute provides for both the right of inspection and the right of copies. Turns out we were wrong in that prediction, at least in, in Mr. John Garius's case. Um, but I'm, again, I, I, I'll defer to Mr. John Garius to uh, describe the circumstances surrounding his situation. Um, that's um, my kind of prepared marks. I can share with you some of the things I'm, I'm hearing about how the, uh, imp uh, the PIA is being uh, implemented, or I'm uh, open to answering any questions you will have, or if you want to move along, I'm happy to stand down. If you wouldn't mind, um, just some of the thoughts of things that you hear uh, from sure. agencies and sure. from the public. Um, one of the things I've, I've heard is the circumstance where um, local governments, typically towns and municipalities that do not, are not, have a large enough town government to justify the expense of in-house counsel. And so they have an outside uh, town attorney who may, you know, bill them at an hourly rate. And when they get a PIA request that involves uh, difficult determinations as to what is and is not um, disclosable, they will ask their outside counsel to review that, uh, uh, you know, review that process. And they can, that outside counsel may charge them at their going rate that they charge the town at, it might be $100, $200 an hour. 
So a PIA requester who believes that maybe it's not a particularly complicated request gets back a bill for $800 and, you know, uh, smells a rat and thinks that the, the locality is trying to run up the, um, uh, the cost of responding. And that, that's not necessarily the case because uh, sometimes attorney review about how different exemptions uh, apply is necessary in order for the agencies to be sure that they're faithfully complying with the law. And if the statute provides that they're allowed to recover their actual costs and their only means of getting legal advice is by sending it to outside counsel, the, the town's not doing anything wrong, but at the same time, you know, the, the, the requester um, feels that they're being um, deliberately frustrated in their efforts to get at, uh, at public records. So that, that's a tension uh, I, I see in, in, in how the act is being implemented. And again, I don't think either side is doing anything wrong there. It's just kind of the nature of the beast. Let's see. Um, another thing that y you might be hearing <laughs> um, is, uh, is how the state is uh, uh, responding to PIA requests. And I want to share with you an example that uh, I think made it into the news um, briefly uh, uh, a couple months ago about a PIA request from a news agency um, seeking all all Public Information Act requests submitted to the Office of the Attorney General since I think it was 2009 and any responses there too. So a PIA request for PIA requests and responses there too. So we get that request and I go out to all the different divisions of the Attorney General's office and say, well, you know, let me know how much do you have any, how expensive would, you know, what would, how much labor will be involved in finding out this information? And what I heard is that, well, some of these divisions have tracking databases that would allow them to identify um, requ specific requests. They would then have to go pull those particular requests, um, uh, and there'd be a, an expense involved in that, but it would allow for a fairly targeted um, search. But a lot of requests come in within the scope of ongoing litigation. And in that instance, these requests, though they might say that they're a PIA request, don't get tracked as a PIA request. The documents are provided in the course of litigation, and the request is just stuck in the agency's file related to that particular case without any kind of tracking record. So I corresponded with the requester that if you really wanted to get all of this, it's going to be a very, very high cost because we're going to have to do a file by file search of those non-tracked um, requests for all these different agencies and kind of explain to them the ins and outs of everything. So that began this dialogue um, that uh, ultimately got us down to the point where the expense was going to be about $150 because really he was only interested in um, requests that were coming in to if you will, the, 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 the attorney general himself or the headquarters of the attorney general's office and not the particular divisions. Um, I say this seemingly mundane story, um, a success story, I think, and how the PIA should work, um, made it into the, the news because the, the, the requester eventually did a story about how uh, the PIA Act is not working because he went to the Attorney General's office to get public records and were t was told that it was going to cost many thousands of dollars to, to get his records. Now that's true. That's what he was told right off the bat because his request was so broad. But once we engaged in the dialogue and kind of figured out what is the best way to get at what he really wanted to get, we got it down to $150. Uh, and, and generally speaking, the fee provision allows for that dialogue um, and in my mind is kind of the way it, it, the statute most effectively works is if, there, if the two, the requester and the agency can work together um, and, and, and try to figure out how to get the, the public the documents that they want in the most efficient manner. Dr. Barber. There we go. 
Uh, you might not be able to answer this question, so let me know if you can't. What proportion of the time do you think when these uh, requests are made are the uh, requested files in digital form? I certainly can't put a hard number on that. Um, Is it a fantastically small percentage? No. No? Okay. No. I mean, if, if only because a, a large chunk of the responsive documents are going to consist of emails. Okay. Which can be, you know, electronically searched and electronically provided under, you know, the right circumstances. Don't ask me how it's done so much, but it, it can be done. Um, and also, the prevalence of people beginning to keep files electronically, so they'll have a finished letter that otherwise might have been in a paper file. A lot of those now get PDF'd and will sit in a, a computer file. So you're seeing it more and more that um, uh, that percentage grows over time. Okay, thank you. Questions from the committee? Uh, I have a couple of questions. Thank you. This was a very, very helpful presentation. Um, the fee structure, it also varies pretty dramatically across local municipalities, uh, counties and, and municipalities, as much as it varies across agencies. Is that fair? You know, uh, I, I, I don't know um, just because I don't Deal. implement that portion of it. And, and it's easy enough to search through Comar and find what the range is. Um, I haven't uh, done that with respect to local uh, government fees. The, and the requirement that, um, or, or the act of putting it in regulation, that some agents, so I guess a DMV and, and, or MBA and um, DHMH, that was by choice. It's not required that their fee structure be outlay or, or uh, illustrated through re regulation. Yeah, I don't believe that's statutorily required, but most agencies do that. Okay. Um, the... The process for waivers, do any agencies have that listed in regulation, the fa these factors, or is that just something each agency determines on their own? Uh, the fee waiver provision? The fee waiver. Um, I, I think the, the vast majority, if not all, of the state agencies have provisions that fairly closely follow the statute that say, you know, uh, we consider the, inabil the, the, the ability of the applicant to pay the fee and other relevant factors and will issue a fee waiver if it's in, in the public interest. I, I'm not aware specifically of any agency that has tried to break that out in greater detail, uh, in part because, well, I mean, the, the courts apply their own set of standards. Uh, an agency spelling it out may get some deference on that point, but I think courts wouldn't be shy about um, um, judging for themselves what, what public interest is, given that it's a flexible enough statutory standard. That makes sense. Uh, thank you. The, the, uh, two more questions. Mm -hmm. um, if an agency makes data regularly available, just as a, as a practice of its cultural habit, um, say through state stat or so, can the agency fulfill its obligations under the PIA by pointing the requester to where that data may be available and accumulated on their own? Excellent question. Um, um, I, I believe so, but uh, it, there, there's not a lot to uh, go on um, to support that. There are provisions of the Public Information Act that encourage agencies to make frequently requested materials publicly available. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't use the word, I don't believe, website, but um, that's kind of uh, what the implication is. So um, it would seem to me that an agency that ab abides by that statutory encouragement and puts these records available on, the, uh, on their website um, should be able to respond to a request for that same information on a diskette by saying it's available on the website. Now that said, you could conceivably have uh, requesters still in this day and age who do not have an internet connection mm -hmm. and live far from a public library and, and whatnot. So you, you can't rule out the possibility that um, standing on that principle wouldn't mean that a particular requester here or there may not be able to gain access to the information that they seek, but I, you know, uh, it, it's, Given the prevalence of Internet, um, I would think agencies 
I think a requester would have to make some kind of a showing uh, of inability to use the website before they'd be able to um, challenge the agents, an agency that is trying to be proactive and put these things on their website. Uh, last question has to do with the appeal process. Um, have, in your experience, have you found that agencies that use the Office of Administrative Hearings uh, have a better or worse uh, relationship with PIA requesters? Has that been a positive experience for most agencies to use OAH or a burdensome negative experience? Um, I, I, I can't really, I don't really have any specific um, experience with respect to particular administrative proceedings involving the PA, PIA. I can tell you more generally, the OAH, generally speaking, is I think preferred by uh, members of the public, whether they're challenging a permit issuance or something like that, because the OAH has that separation from the agency. Mm -hmm. And typically, the, the, the criticism of the process that you hear is not so much that it's going to the OAH, but that at the end of the day, the OAH only renders a proposed decision, mm -hmm. and it comes back to the agency for a final decision. That, that, that last step is what uh, people more frequently uh, complain about. Um, not, not so much that it, it goes to the OAH. Yes, Doug Moore. Um, did I gather from what you said that there's some differences between agencies in fees, in uh, that some have some of these rules and regulations and some don't, uh, and maybe some other policies? Is that the case? Well, uh, I, yes. Okay. I, I, not all of the instrumentalities of the state that are subject to the Public Information Act have regulations addressing how they're going to implement the act. Um, the vast majority do, um, and they have fee provisions um, in them that, address, that cover this ground. Well, let me re ask it this way then. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense, with possible some, some exceptions here and there that could be justified, that there be consistency across state agencies for this purpose? With respect to the fees charged? With respect to policies, fees, although there may be some exceptions because of unique circumstances of privacy or whatever. But, would, I mean, part of the theory here, I think, would be that if a citizen contacts one agency, they, they know what's going on. If they contact another one, they should have the same set of circumstances, not have to learn that, well, this one's in regulation, this one costs, charges 20 cents, this one charges 25 cents a copy. Would it make sense to do that? I think with the caveat that you provided that um, there be flexibility to tailor it in particular circumstances, yeah, I think there would be some value okay. to have that kind of consistency. So is this the kind of thing that you could audit the agencies and, uh, you know, kind of stagger out their, their, their common areas and the few areas that might be different and then present a op policy option, whether that's every agency is just going to do it by executive push or whether we have to do legislation that would say, you know, for the common stuff, you're going to have the same set of rules everywhere, including some of the things that the other, uh, the chairman and, and, Del and the other two chairmen asked. Yeah, and, I, and the fee structure should be the same too. And then if there's certain unique circumstances like trying to send out a map or, or uh, judicial issues, um, then you could have some variance. Does that make sense? It, it does, but I, I do want to, I mean, it, it's, I think it's, um, I can't rule out the possibility that even the per page copying fee mm -hmm. may vary from, have good reasons for varying from agency to agency. For example, MVA has a very low per page co copying fee, and it may be because they've got lots and lots of copiers. They deal with document requests all the time, and um, they've got it down to a science, as odd as that might sound. Um, uh, other agencies may not. And, and, and perhaps a local government may only have one copier that, um, that you know, ha have the local government out of it for a moment. Because okay. Because they're going to, we don't really right. control Well, you might government. have a board or a commission that falls roughly okay. into that same category. But, but, but theoretically speaking, yeah, it would seem to me that you should be able to achieve okay. um, somewhat more uniformity on these types of topics. Maybe that's another thing we can explore. Because I, I think from the point of view of the general public, whatever – differences we see, they see government as one large amorphous, you know, entity, and it ought to be as consistent as possible. Um, you know, we get requests, you know, about immigration issues. We're not federal legislators. We all get 
communications about a stop sign. We're not local legislators, but they see us as part of government and they expect a response that's uh, appropriate and, 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 and directive. But you can't just say to people, that's not my area. I think the same thing here. The more that it's uh, made consistent, the easier it will be. And if there's a mechanism that you can initiate by surveying the agencies and then finding the common ground stuff and then allow some variance, I think that would be helpful. Well, we, we do have, uh, the Attorney General's Office has on its website model regulations for implementing the Public Information Act that include this 25 percent page per page fee that, you know, most agencies appear to have adopted. And when I scroll through the different COMAR provisions, a lot of them bear a lot of resemblance to the model regulations on our, our website. So there's some standardization, but I'm sure there would be opportunities for a lot more. Thank you very much. I think with, with that, we will move to the next panel. Um, thank you. That was very, very helpful. Uh, so we have two panels um, today for this section.